afternoon. I'm John Hennessy, President of Stanford University, and it's my pleasure today to introduce Bill Gates and to welcome him back to Stanford. Bill Gates truly is one of those few people on the earth who needs no introduction. His founding of Microsoft, his leadership in technology, and the inspiring work that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has undertaken has inspired people and built a reputation around the world. This is not the first time Bill has stopped by Stanford to tell us about his activity and discuss his vision with Stanford students. We're grateful that he's been able to stop by and cut some time in his schedule after visiting Africa. About 15 years ago, when Bill was still leading Microsoft and he and I were still both approaching middle age, I asked Bill about his philanthropic plans. And I remember quite clearly what he told me. He said that he was too busy leading Microsoft and didn't have the time to be a thoughtful philanthropist. And he would have to consider that after Microsoft. Well, since then, Bill has distinguished himself as a philanthropist who's clearly taken the time to dig in and learn about problems in depth, mastering new subjects along the way. His interest in global health led him to spending a lot of time studying microbiology. Indeed, earlier today, Bill visited some of our Stanford faculty and students whose research is focused on areas of interest to the Gates Foundation. Bill and Melinda Gates study each problem relentlessly. They share what they learn. They invite others to join them in collaboration to figure out how we can make the best possible approach and the best possible success in improving the lives of disadvantaged people around the world. And although many other organizations have given up in frustration over the challenges of improving health in Africa, the Gates Foundation has not only persisted, but has made progress and has inspired others to join them. Bill's message of innovation as key to improving the life of people around the world clearly resonates on this campus. We're honored that he's chosen to visit Stanford today and share some of his work. He's just returned from a trip to Ethiopia and Zambia, working on issues like malaria, agricultural productivity, and community health outreach. Bill's going to talk for about 25 or 30 minutes, and then we'll have time to ask him some questions. So please join me in welcoming Bill Gates back to Stanford University. Well, thank you. It's great to be here, and I, I think this should be a lot of fun. Uh, I always love coming to great places like Stanford, uh, meeting with the people doing the research. That's not just going to improve the world, but it's going to improve the condition uh, for those most in need. And today I got to meet with some really brilliant people uh, working on tuberculosis drugs in one case, malaria drugs in another case. And, uh, and I'm always really thrilled to see that science is being focused on those needs. Uh, there's a real danger that science wouldn't focus on those needs, that it would just simply do what the richest need because the market signals push us in that direction. Of course, I was a student uh, at one point. I never did graduate. Uh, but uh, at that time, you know, I was excited about the microprocessor. It had just been created. In fact, the, the chips that were out at that time were very, very limited. And you had to extrapolate from what the uh, 8008, the original chip was, and look at the kind of doubling that was going to take place to realize that eventually it would be powerful enough to make a huge difference. And that's the thing that got me excited. That's the thing that uh, I called up my dad and said, OK, I'm leaving Harvard. Uh, and he said, well, will you go back? And I said, OK, at some point I'll go back. Uh, and so I go back kind of a day at a time to various universities to make up uh, <laughs> a couple years that I still owe uh, in terms of uh, time at universities. And you know that was a very exciting project. It was based on the idea that software was the magic that would bring that chip to life. And the idea that a uh, tool to leverage human uh, curiosity, to leverage human understanding, to let people 
communicate new ways, to create rich documents, that that would become something of importance. And in a way, it was easier to do because we were creating products, personal computers that were getting connected together, that we ourselves could understand why we wanted, that you know, every new feature was something that was uh, exciting for us to have and to use, and we had a full appreciation of those things. And as I look back on my university experience, I wouldn't change anything but one thing, which is that I definitely got through school without having a sense of how the, the poorest in the world lived. I had no sense about disease, about nutrition, about uh, what it means to have no infrastructure, what it means to have a government uh, that doesn't work. And so it, it was much later that it was almost like a comeuppance when I was traveling uh, initially on behalf of Microsoft and later on behalf of the foundation uh, that I got to see the real conditions out there. And so, uh, you know, it's great to pursue curiosity, but you also have to have this broad view of things, and I, I definitely uh, miss that. Now that we have these great tools, you can say, okay, well, how are they going to be used? What difference will they really make? And what metrics should you apply to this? Uh, you know, should you just apply an economic metric? You know, is GDP going up? Well, that's a very indirect way of looking at things. A much more direct way of looking at things is to look at things like literacy, uh, look at things like uh, average life expectancy, uh, to look at a number like how many children uh, live past the age of five. Uh, if you go back uh, merely 150 years ago, it didn't matter whether you were a rich country or a poor country. Over a third of the children died before the age of five. Uh, pretty uniform, didn't, didn't matter if your family was rich or poor, that was the way things were. And through a series of inventions, uh, antibiotics, vaccines, uh, many of which are only uh, within the last hundred years, that changed very dramatically. And so now in the, the very richest countries, out of a thousand children under the age of five, only five or six die. And so it's a very rare event, it's a very tragic event. But now we do have a, a gigantic differential at this point in time. Uh, because in the poorest countries, it has come down. It's no longer uh, as high as it was, say, in the richest country 150 years ago. It's not up at like 350. It's down around 200 in the poorest countries. But that's still an incredible tragedy. It's about 20% uh, of the kids uh, that uh, should, should be alive at age five have died of one cause or another, malaria, respiratory disease, uh, diarrhea, all of which, you may know, we have drugs to deal with those things, but the lack of access, the lack of infrastructure, the lack of uh, understanding means that those are very fatal diseases.